Hi guys, I'm back again. This is Lone Vic and today we are talking about how to play and how to set up a game of Unsettled. This is the newest Kickstarter game from Orange Nebula, the guys responsible for the great, cool and one of my favorites, Vindication. And this arrived like last week from Kickstarter, so it's a pretty fresh game and I will tell you today how to set it up how to play it and how to tear it down and fit it into this box after the game based on an example session of Vendora or Wendora or whatever you call it, the first planet from the game which has the lowest challenge difficulty level. So without further ado, let's take a look at what we have here. Okay, so I've set up the basic trays that you can find inside the main box. We've got uh, the uh, moments tray here, we've got the time and group trust tray over here, we've got the resource tray here, and we've got the breakthrough tray over there. This is, recommend, this is the recommended setup uh, from the rulebook and it's very comfortable around the table if it's done like so. We've got also two player trays for a two player game but there is no difference in setting up this game for three or four people. Uh, this game is playable from two to four, there is no solo mode right now. And we've got the box with the Vendora or Vendora planet in the middle, we will be using this in a moment. Now, when you take the box the game out of the box for the first time, you will find that all of the components here uh, onto those boards, those game trays, have to be filled in, but later when we will be tearing it down at the end of the video, you will see that those components, most of those components can remain in those trays, making setup this much easier later on for the next few games and also making the storage very easy. Okay, so let's start with this board, which is the time and group trust board. And for this, you need only two markers. You need the trust marker, which is this little black cube with the trust symbol on it. And you place it here on this white area where the group trust is high and we need the time marker which is this white circle with an hourglass and you put it here on the first slot on the corresponding area and this is the time and group trust board set up. Now let's take a look at the moments tray. For the moments tray we need two big huge markers, those transparent ones that mark our opportunities. And we put the pink one here and we put the blue one here. These areas will be filled in from the box with the planet, so we leave them alone for now. And we need also 12 markers for investigations. And we should put them here so that they all fit. They go in stacks of four. That's the best way to keep them here. So I'll just distribute them evenly. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, and one, two, three, four. Okay, cool. Like so. So this board is done. Now we've got the resource board. We need to fill in those four trays here. The first one is filled with data cubes. So I will just throw in all of those here. There we go. The second one should be filled with material crystals and we've got plenty of those green ones over here as well. Wait, there we go. And the last big tray should be filled with black markers, which don't have any specific name, but they are used for different effects on different planets. This last area, the dynamo, should be filled with those little power cells and they should all be in the negative space. And this is the resource board set up. Now, for the last board, we need the three building tiles, which is the laboratory, which goes in over the green column, the workshop, which goes over the red, and the blue one, which is the research hut. Take note that those tokens are double-sided and I'm placing them with this square symbol face up. Now, those three columns here 
are called comprehension markers or the spaces are called the comprehension markers and those are comprehensions of the free scientific disciplines that your players your characters will be studying and this is robotics and we put the four robotics tokens into this column we have chemistry and we put the four green chemistry tokens here and we also have the red uh, engineering comprehension and we put those here. Now those are the four trays set up. As for the players we obviously need the player miniatures so I've got the red and the green one. We also need three focus dice for each player one in each color so we need a green blue and red focus die and during the game we decide what level of difficulty we want to set up in the beginning of the game by setting up those focus dice and in this case if you are playing with two explorers and you set all those dice to a number of two focus you will get a standard level of difficulty if you want to make it more difficult you would need to set one of those dice for each player to one and so forth and so on the rulebook gives you a good view over of those values so each player needs those we'll be setting up a standard game so we'll be setting up each of those to the number of two we need also endurance markers which are those transparent cubes which are put here on the endurance track on the top spot we also need the inside cubes which we place on the bottom spot of this inside track and we can place them whatever color we want to show from the free ones of the free scientific disciplines and this means that your character will be pursuing this discipline from the beginning of the game this can later change but this initial decision is kind of maybe not obligatory but it starts you off somehow so it's cool when each player has a different discipline that they are pursuing in the beginning of the game. Now the next thing is that we also need those two uh, dice for resources. They are called the discovery dice and we also need them somewhere around so I'll put them over here and now for the end of the player setup the players need to choose their avatar token. Now this doesn't really matter which avatar token you take they are just here for cosmetic purposes you slot them here but sometimes you need to use them to mark some effects in the game influencing a potential a specific character so you should just choose the one that you will remember that is yours and that's it so this is the player setup more or less done the last thing that you need for the player setup is to choose uh, a well character trait I would call it maybe this is the easiest way and the rulebook also suggests to do it randomly without reading into those effects so let's do it like that so basically you should randomly assign two of those traits to each of the characters and each player chooses one of those traits the rest of them go into the box and when the player chooses a trait they look at the name of the skill which the trait will cover. In this case for example the optimist has the traverse skill so we cover the traverse field on the board of the red player and let's say that the green player is a skeptic and the skeptic has a theorize ability and he will cover the theorize field here. Be aware that you have to put those tiles the white side up because they have a black side reverse because Team Trust is on the white background. If Team Trust ever lowers into the black background, those tiles get immediately flipped and they will cover their corresponding abilities. But for now, they are white, so we will leave it here. And there are also player aids which you can distribute to the players, so each player can get one, but I will be using only one to remember about all the actions that we need to take in this game. So this is everything that you need to play the game before you open the planet box. So now let's take a look at Wendora. I've already uh, 
kind of prepared myself for this game uh, with setting up all of the components inside the box. This is not how you will find them during your first playthrough. They will all be in shrink wrapped foil and everything, but uh, I've already uh, done the work with unpacking this. Now, read through the manual for each planet because it describes all of the effects that the planet will have and all the rule changes that you will need to introduce as well as, as, well as the setup generally of the planet. So be aware of that and uh, read it carefully. And now in this box with Wendora, I will take out the whole game tray. Basically, this will be easier. Yeah, we have two levels of components. Let's start with the bottom one. In the bottom, you have a lot of small cards that you can divide into different colors, basically, and place them somewhere nearby. There is one card that's called a Luna card. There are four robotic blue breakthrough cards, four green chemistry breakthroughs, four orange engineering breakthroughs. There are a lot of distress cards and a lot of scientific anomaly cards. Now, you should shuffle each of those piles separately, obviously. You take the Luna card, flip it to this side with the action box, and place it here on the breakthrough board. And each planet has a different card for Luna, so you will be uh, using a different one from each box. Now the breakthroughs, after shuffling, go under each corresponding color of the scientific uh, disciplines, so like so. Take the distress cards, Reaper player, return the rest to the box, and those cards, after shuffling, go here, and the anomalies also, after shuffling, go here. Now, the box is usually also assisted, uh, <laughs> filled with tokens, various ones, so uh, all those various tokens will go here. This is the place to store any planet-specific tokens. But we also have the, those moment tokens, and these should be distributed here in any order you wish. The, these, this is just for organizing, uh, for organization purposes, and it doesn't influence the gameplay in any way. So I'll just put them here on this display, and this insert is out of the game. Now, there are a lot of big cards here as well, as well as this gigantic token, which also goes here. And these big cards also come in a lot of varieties. We've got environment cards, we've got opportunity cards, we've got hallucination cards, which are planet-specific cards, and we've got mission cards. So, we take the environment cards and we obviously shuffle those, and the environment section is here. We've got environment written here, so we can put them down here. Now, hallucination cards go into the planet-specific category, and they should be placed here. We take the opportunities, we also shuffle them and distribute them evenly in two stacks below the two opportunity markers, so that each stack has at least an equal number. And then we have the three missions in three colors. We've got in here blue, green, and yellow. And we can decide which mission or which task, which story do we want to follow. I will choose task A. So I will choose those four blue uh, cards. I will put the rest back into the box. And I should take a look at the top of the those mission cards, we've got a number here, as you can see, 1 through 8, and on the reverse side, 2 through 8. So you should place those cards in an order like a book, basically, from 1 to, on the other side, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8. And with this stack, you should place those cards here, with 1 on top and 8 on the other side from the bottom. Whew. Now you are almost prepared. The last thing you do is you take the scarab tile from the box. There are three of those, and you can choose either one. And if you want to play on an easier difficulty, you flip it to the scarab token, to the scarab side with the action uh, on, uh, on the scarab tile. Or if you are playing on a normal or harder difficulty, the scarab has no action. But this is your starting area, basically.
And if you look into the manual of the planet, to the small rulebook of the planet, they will tell you that right now it's time to read your first mission. So you should read the story for the first mission, and after you do, like in a book, you flip the card here and you've got the setup. So the game tells you how to set up the whole map in this case. And in this case, it will be more logical for me to go vertically because we need one, two, three, four tiles in each row. And the last card, according to the description, is a swampy quagmire. So I should find the swampy quagmire card place it here on the end, the second one should be discarded, shuffle the rest of the environments and deal them one, two, three, and ooh, this will be even on a bigger table as you can see, because I've changed the place when I'm recording, especially for this game because it's so big, it's a bit tight here, but we can manage. So you distribute those tiles here, and you put the player, minis, and Luna, this is what would be a space exploration game without your friendly, all-knowing AI computer running around with you and helping out, onto the Scarab. And now we can play the game. So this is the setup for Unsettled Planet 1. I won't be showing you any spoilers, I'll be careful about that, so we will just go through a few of those tiles to show you actions and movements and such. And for now, we are done. Let's go into how to play this great game. Okay, guys, if you're back with this video, you're back with me still, so you, you want to know how to play a game of Unsettled, so here we go. Now, in Unsettled, each player will be taking up to four main actions during their turn and a countless number of free actions that they want to take, and then they will be passing the turn to the next player and you will have to fulfill all missions that are required of you before your time runs out, meaning your endurance gets from the top to the bottom of this tr endurance track. If both players are at the bottom of the endurance track at the same time, the game is over, you died, you have to try another time. But if only one player gets their endurance low, the second one, the other one can still finish, and this is kind of a Paris victory, it's kind of a semi-victory case, because, well, you, you still did it, but, well, not everybody survived. Okay, so let's talk about the main actions. Now, the simplest main action is connected with Luna, because Luna will be also moved and acted upon by each player. Now, each player in their round can do with Luna two things. One, they can move Luna one square, one node, because those uh, environments are called nodes, one by one node from where she is, and they can also scan the node that Luna is on. So let's do that. So the red player is starting and he would, they would move here with Luna and this means that Luna uncovers the tile. Now, no effects on the tiles or no effects on the edges of the tiles influence Luna. So she's basically safely exploring everything, right? Uh, so Luna just uncovered this tile and now, the second action that Luna can do is scan a node. Now, Luna can scan a node for data or materials, and you choose which one it is, and you roll a corresponding die. Now, the result on the die, which is a 3 in this case, means that Luna has found 3 units of data, which are placed directly on the node. Later, the players will be able to collect those, this data from this node. For now, it's only placed here. Now, if you want to scan with Luna again, you can, but you can't scan for a resource that's already on the node. So in this case, if the second player wanted to scan with Luna, they would be only able to scan for materials. If you deplete this, uh, if you collect all of those data, you can scan for data again, and so forth and so on. So if there were green crystals and blue data cubes here on this node, Luna wouldn't be able to scan, she would be only able to move and so on. Okay, so those are the two main actions. So on your turn you can move Luna and you can use her to scan a node. Now you can also move your own mini 
in this case, uh, this is your third main action that you can do, and you also move one node. Now, if you are moving into a node that was already uncovered like by Luna, like, like I did right now, you already know if there is an effect here that would um, be problematic for you or not. But when you are moving, you are also affected by those edges on the map. In this case, there is a purple insight symbol on the edge, which means that the red player increases their insight by one. We'll talk about it later. If I moved here across the hourglass symbol, across the time symbol, I would have to advance the time marker by one. And if I moved into an unexplored area, I would have to flip it as well. And see, if I moved into it, because I would have to, right, I would advance the time by two, because one for this symbol, one for this time symbol as well. And this effect says that when entering, if you possess rare polymers, this is a keyword, and I don't possess it, then you would be able to trigger this effect, but I don't have rare polymers, so I wouldn't be able to do that, right? So this is moving, basically, by one. And the last action, and the only one that's obligatory for every player to do, is use their free focus dice. Now, moving Luna, investigating with Luna, or um, moving your own character is not obligatory. You can do it, you don't have to, but using those three dice is obligatory. Each player has to do it during their own turn. Now, how you do that is you distribute those dice among those areas which those dice fit. You have six areas on your player board, you have one, two, three areas here, You've got one, two, three, four areas on the uh, breakthrough board as well, but one of those dice always has to go to the rest action. The last die has to go to the rest action, which means that you've ended your turn. So basically you can do two actions plus a rest action with any die. Now let's go through these one by one. Now I will clear this uh, character tile to show you the basic actions and also talk about those and then I will tell you how the character actions might change something. So let's start with the fact that some of those areas for your dice are black and some of them are white. If an area is black and it has an arrow that's pointing down that means that when you use this area you have to reduce your die by one or two or three depending on the number of arrows number down. If you use a die that has a time symbol on it and you still have to reduce it by any count, this reduces, this advances the time marker by that number. So for example, if I had a time symbol on my die and I wanted to use it and it needs me to reduce it, the effect needs me to reduce it once, then I would do it like this, but I still can use the action, I still can use the die, right? If the area is white and it has an up arrow, that means that you increase the die by this much, but you can't increase it above three. Nothing happens if you have a dice on three and you would increase it in any way. And some areas like this one on the skeptic don't have an arrow, so the die doesn't go up, doesn't go down, it stays in the same spot. Okay, so a player might use six actions on the player board, plus a few more actions here on those resource and breakthrough boards, and there are sometimes actions on the map that they can use as well. Sometimes you will find actions in the opportunities, sometimes you will find actions in the missions, and sometimes you will find actions any, in, in different places as well. So every time you have a square here, that means that you can put a die and use an action. So the theorize action, allows another explorer to gain one insight. So if I use a die here on the theorize action, there is a down arrow here, I would have to reduce this die and I would give another player, so the green player, one insight on this insight track. If I use a blue die here, see the blue symbol over here below the uh, area for the die, that means that this triggers a bonus effect. So not only I would give another explorer one insight, but I would also gain one insight because there is an insight symbol, the purple square, here in the field. So if I did it like this, I would reduce it by one, I would get one insight and the green player would gain one as well. Now, investigating works similarly, but with a green die. So if I use a green die and reduce it by one, the green bonus means that I would get one insight, and investigation means that I can pursue an opportunity on my node. So 
if this is the red player, I've uh, moved the green one instead, if this is the red player here, I can choose which color of opportunity I want. Let's say that red goes well with pink. And I would flip over the first opportunity card on top. Now, you can read the flavor text here, which is always pretty useful, right? So you can read the flavor text here, immediately activate this effect that's below the flavor text, and then you have another area to place your die in and collect those rewards after you have used a die to trigger this opportunity. And you also choose the corresponding tile from the display of the opportunities, you place it here. Now, what happens when a player triggers this effect and collects this opportunity? There are sometimes different conditions to be uh, aware of here. Like, for example, you sometimes need a keyword or you need to spend some resources or something. Now, in this case, if you reach into the sphere and you take this hover blossom, you will gain two insights. You've got two insight symbols here, but you will also gain an anomaly card, which you place here with this tile like this and you discard the used opportunity and you return this marker here. So this would mean that the opportunity has been used and it can be used by the player who activated it, who investigated it, and it can be used by another player on another turn, it depends. One more thing, when you are investigating a square, you place an investigated token on the square so that no more opportunities can be investigated here. So basically you've got 1, 2, 3, 12 squares, you can investigate 12 opportunities during a single game, and that's it. So what are those opportunities? As you can see on those cards, opportunities are very useful, can be very useful things. Opportunities give, grant you your, your character keywords, which trigger some effects on the map or trigger some effects connected with the missions, they also can be used once, so you have to discard this anomaly that you've received in order to fulfill the effect that's described, but the condition is that you have to have some comprehension in one of the science trees. So this is how anomalies work, and you can gain anomalies mostly, or usually, by doing opportunities, by discovering and benefiting from opportunities. Right? So let's leave that here. Now, I've mentioned that you need comprehension. So how does comprehension work? You saw how to advance this insight track, right? Uh, you can do it by using appropriate dice on appropriate areas, sometimes by crossing edges of the map, sometimes by doing opportunities. Different things happen, right? Uh, if the die anytime is on the last space of the insight track and it has to move up, it circles around and you gain the comprehension of the same color. So I would take this red symbol, put it here, and also take one breakthrough and place it here. Now, breakthroughs are special cards that give you long-lasting abilities. You can use this ability once every turn. So you can use it once on your turn, once on another player's turn, and once on another player's turn, and then so forth and so on. But every single time you use it, you have to pay the cost. In this case, the cost is one energy charge. And you can have as many breakthroughs as you want, as long as you have those areas here to fill. If you have four areas filled with different breakthroughs, with different comprehensions, and you've got four breakthroughs corresponding to them, and you collect the fifth one, you have to decide the fifth token replaces one of those four that you already have, and you have to swap out one breakthrough accordingly. Now, after you collect a comprehension, you can set this die again to a different color to start obtaining different science uh, comprehension tokens, and also different breakthroughs. But remember one thing, comprehensions pool from players. So if, for example, there are two players on the same node, and one of them has comprehension in chemistry, and another has a comprehension in engineering, and the action that you need to take, for example, on this area, requires comprehension in chemistry, the red player can do this, because there is a player present there who has comprehension in chemistry. So, my comprehension in engineering benefits the green player and his comprehension chemistry benefits me as well, right? So those are collectives. Sometimes you need more than one comprehension for an action to take place. 
those are different requirements and you'll be discovering them throughout the game. Okay, enough talking about investigating comprehensions, let's leave it at that. Now the third action, let's reset those dice here, is called Traverse. Traverse reacts with a bonus of Insight with a red die, so if I used this red die with 2 and lower it to 1, I would get Insight again, and I could move and or carry a local explorer one a node. So this gives me an additional movement, I could uncover a new tile, I could go back somewhere, but also if there is a player present on my node, I could move with him together, carrying him, and any triggers that I have on the edges of the node would only work on me. So I would waste two time, but this player wouldn't. So this is a great uh, method of, you know, uh, moving around together. Now support means removing one distress from another local explorer. Those distress cards can be obtained based on some rules of the planet usually. I won't be talking about the rules for Vendora, you'll have to read about them on your own into, in, the, in the manual for the planet, because, well, this would spoil quite a lot and, you know, uh, surprises. But any time a game effect tells you to collect one distress, that means that you take a distress card, you flip it, you uh, read the instruction what you have to do when you gain this card. In this case, when gained, lower the trust. And the moment you have two or more distresses, draw a hallucination card. This is a special thing that you do on Wendora. But if the red player collected a, a distress, they have to cover any of the action slots that they have so that it won't be usable anymore. You can't cover the rest action slot. The rest action slot is uncoverable. And now you cover this slot and you have distress. And the support action can remove one distress from another local explorer. Now two keywords here, local meaning on the same node and another meaning you can't remove distress from yourself. So in order to remove this distress, the green player would have to launch his support action when being on the same node as me. And then you remove this distress and also the group trust shows an up arrow, so the group trust would go up. More on that later. Now, distress has a limiting kind of quality. Any time a player has five distress cards on their board and is should, the game effect forces them to take a sixth one, you can't cover the rest action. So instead of that, each player lowers their endurance by one. Also, if at any time all of the cards that you have for distress are used and the game tells you to draw another one and you have nowhere to draw from, players lose one endurance. So this moves you closer to death, basically. Now, endurance also has this little tiny quality at the bottom that you may move the endurance from one action to another if needed, but there is this downward arrow here which means that you have to reduce one of your dies by one when you do that, right? So be careful with using that as well. So this is support allows you to clear one distress from another player and also moves the group trust by one. And you've got a recover action which allows you to charge up a die by three, so up to the maximum basically, but it lowers group trust as well. And now let's go to the group trust for a moment. When the game tells you to lower group trust to black, you flip those actions that you have on your characters to the black side and cover the appropriate areas. When group trust raises to white, you flip those tiles to the white again and group trust increases and you have different actions available, right? But what happens when group trust has to increase and it's already on white or decrease and it's already on black? If it's on white and it increases, two, two dice need to be raised by one tick, two focus dice, from the same player or different players collectively. The same goes if group trust is lowered if it's on the black two dice need to be lowered by one tick collectively by any players. And so you can choose who uh, is going to do it, who is going to lose or gain in any case. And this is how group trust works. And then we've got the rest action, which charges up your focus die by one if you use it there. And remember, this has to be the last action you do. So if we had already this action used here, 
and we had this action used here, as I previously shown you, then rest would go here. I would use the red die, charge it up by one, and, and it has the hourglass, which has to move the time track ahead. And this is the end of my turn. I take off my focus dice and leave them on those new positions, and then it's the green player's turn, and my turn is over. So to recap, to sum up, on my turn, I can move Luna by one. I can investigate a node with Luna, losing either using either the data or material die and collecting resources. I can move my character and I have to use those three dice. One of them has to be used on the rest action. And after I use those dice, I take them off my board. And that means that my round is over. Now, Every time I use a rest action, the time counter moves ahead. And if it's on the last spot of the track, it loops around if it should move ahead. And each player loses one endurance, getting us closer to death, basically. So uh, this is kind of the game counter in here. Now, there are a few actions here that I haven't mentioned yet. And I will quickly do that right now. If you put any of your dice here in those areas, depending on the color of the die, you can collect one data or two data if it's a blue die, one material or two material if it's a green die. You can charge up one energy or two energy, like so, plus is the charged one, if you use a red die here. And you can collect those data and materials only if you are in a nodes with uncovered data and materials from Luna. You can charge up anytime. You don't need to have those tokens on the node. So in this case, for example, if the red player was here, he would be able to use the blue die from one to the hourglass. Nothing happens yet because he just flipped it to collect two data and put them here in the database from where you can spend your tokens. So the green tokens would be collected from the board into here. The red ones would be charged up here and you can only spend the tokens that are in the plus for energy or in those database and stockpiles for the green and the blue respectively. And spending them doesn't cost anything. You can do it anytime. But collecting them works like this. And now there is a Luna card over there, which has a different effect based on what planet you are on. And the description is pretty clear on those, so I won't be getting into that. And there are three buildings. If you want to create a building, you have to use any die on the building, lower it by one, take the building and put it on a building spot. Luckily, we have one here because you can't build a building if you don't have a building spot uncovered. You put the building here with the die, and if you have comprehension in that color's science uh, category, you don't have to waste any time. But if not, then you have to advance the time by one. And when the focus die is taken off the building, you flip it to the other side and the action becomes available. And the actions can be used wherever you are. You don't have to be at the building to use the action. You can be on the other side of the map, but you can still use the action by spending the actual resource. So in this case, you can propel Luna from anywhere by spending one energy and you can move Luna by one to make her uncover, for example, a new node, like so. There you go. The green building will allow you to exchange data, uh, materials for uh, loading, charging up your focus dice. And the blue building will allow you to exchange your data that you've collected for insights. And you can do it as many times as you can, as you have resources to do so. So we're pretty far ahead into what's going on here on the board and on the planet. Now, those were the main actions, the four main actions that you can do. Apart from those main actions, you can also do any number of free actions on your turn. And those free actions are pretty minor tweaks to what you can achieve during the game. Now, the free actions mean using those breakthroughs that you've collected by obviously playing the cost and you can use every breakthrough only once per turn. You can also use the anomalies by discarding them along with the token to use this effect, but only if you have the comprehension of the appropriate color. This is marked by this comprehension symbol and the wording must be present to do that. You can forfeit an opportunity. This is not recommended, but anytime there is an opportunity uncovered on the board, you can decide to forfeit it. So basically to remove it because you 
state that it's not worth your time and you would rather uh, uncover a different opportunity because there can be only two opportunities at a time. You have only two opportunity tokens and two opportunity stacks. So you can't have more of those. You can alter your scientific pursuit, which means you can change this die from the color that you currently have to a new one because you decide that this comprehension is not necessary for you anymore. But when you do that during your turn, you will have to lower yourself back to the bottom area in this track. Now, if you would wrap around and gain a comprehension, you can set the die to any different color again, like for free, without uh, having any uh, losses, right? But if you are uh, changing this uh, inside color during your collecting, you would have to reset it as well. You can exchange discoveries. If you are on the same node as another player, you can exchange breakthroughs and anomalies and items in your inventory. Now, I'm not talking about the inventory because only specific planet rules tell you to put something into your inventory. So this is the space on the board where you have to put something. But if you're on the same node, you can exchange anomalies, breakthroughs and inventory uh, freely between players. And you can contribute to survival tasks, which are usually the tasks for missions, uh, where you have to do something by being on a node or uh, something else. So that's in general it. Now, I won't be uh, spoiling to you any rules connected with this map or with playing Venora. You will have to read those on your own in order to figure out how these work because, well, that's the whole fun of Unsettled, to be able to uncover a new planet, find out what the rules are that are governing this new strange place and try to adapt to them and try to win in a hostile and unfriendly environment by, you know, collecting resources and uh, comprehension and uh, fulfilling tasks and finding opportunities and so and so and such. So this is the main adventure. I will also uh, only mention to you a few things that are kind of glanced over uh, in the general rules. Now, those keywords that you can find in many different places, like for example here on the boards, when it says that when entering, if you possess this keyword, do something. Or for example, on a card, let's find a card that has something like this. I don't know if there will be something on Venora. But, for example, this, where it says that explorers on this node with the phrase fungal host will get one insight and can increase one focus die by one. So those keywords are usually obtained by drawing anomalies from the anomaly pile, so by resolving opportunities. And those keywords remain with you until you discard this anomaly. And if you transfer the anomaly to another player by the exchange discoveries free action, this keyword goes with the card to the new player. So this is one of the only ways to obtain those keywords. And those keywords are sometimes very, very important in order to, uh, you know, fulfill some objectives. Another thing is that some of the opportunities and some of other game effects might have the catchphrase engage or engaging. This would mean that if an opportunity is engaging, it will follow the player wherever he goes. Or if an effect is engaged, it would also follow a player. Now, if an opportunity is engaging, you can never forfeit it because it's stuck to the player, but you will have to complete it or deal with it any other way. And one more thing that isn't talked about too much on Venora is that the game also comes with something called timeline trigger tokens. And the timeline trigger tokens work like so. If the game effect tells you to put a timeline trigger somewhere on the timeline, it marks the moment in which when the hourglass token meets this trigger, the effect connected to this token would trigger. And sometimes it will trigger every single cycle of the uh, time marker. Sometimes it triggers only once. It all depends on the planet and on the gaming effects. Okay, so I hope this gets you closer to playing Unsettled. I hope that this clarifies 
the majority or some at least of the general rules there are quite a few of them but they are very very user friendly and very uh, logical and the most important thing in the rule book that's written in the universal rules for the game is that whenever you have doubt or wherever there is a doubt whether you can perform an action or not perform an action use this for the player's benefit and do the thing that's logical for the story. This is your story, this is your exploration, so you should do it however you choose so that you can feel, you know, comfortable with it and uh, so that everything works. So right now, let's take a look at how to tear down this game and hide it into the box after you've played a session. So basically, you should return all the tokens into the uh, correct slots on those boards, right? We will start with hiding, with packing the planet, which should be pretty easy. So uh, all of the cards that we've taken out of the planet box should be returned there, not the scarab tile, of course. So all the environments, like so, together with this, and the one that I've discarded. All the opportunities, like so, the hallucinations, there you go, the mission cards in the correct order, obviously, we put them below, and we put them into this top tray of the box. I also load it with this gigantic token, because, well, why not? In the bottom, we take all of those tokens that are planet characteristics, so I'm taking all of these tokens with the tentacles and also here you've got the space for those 12 opportunity tokens which should go here so i'm putting those in there you go like so and finally there is a place for all of the cards so we've got anomalies which go here we've got the distresses which go here, there should be 12 of them, and we've got the breakthroughs which we can divide like this, so it's even, don't forget, Luna, the action card which goes here, and this should close, this should close, oh sorry I forgot about these tokens here, <laughs> silly me, these tokens also go here, right? and this should close, and this should close, and this goes back into the planet box together with the rulebook for the planet. So this is the planet wrapped up. And now as for the game, the game has a tray inside the box where you have the place for the miniatures, the Luna miniature, all of the focus dice like so, your character faces, those tokens here, you've got the endurance, those comprehension dice, you return all those markers here, these two dice go here, all of the character traits go here, we can put these two markers in here as well, the time and group trust markers, the scarab tiles, because there are three in total, go here, and now what we can do now is we can take the game box and we basically lower this tray into the game box. We put the player boards on the top, one, two, and there is a third and a fourth one. We would take the two planets we've got with the game, so this would be Venora and this would be also, whoops, Garakis, and we would put them on top, and then those trays with the corresponding tokens in them, so that the setup is easier in the future, go on top and they slide one into another, like so, with the time board being on the very top, like this. And the final thing is that we put the player aids back inside we put the rule book in its spot and we can close the lid on this fine game that's called Unsettled. 
My name is Lone Vic. This is Unsettled from Orange Nebula. I hope that after this video you have some idea of how to play, set up and tear down the game. It's a game from two to four players. Should take you about two, three hours to play. Thank you for watching this video. Check out the rest of my channel where I have some reviews and um, how to plays and unboxings of super cool games that I like and I want to share with you guys. If you like the video, hit the subscribe button, click a like, leave a trace in the comments. See you very soon. Have a great day. Bye bye.